Okay, we're going to move on to the next and final session before we uh, go into a break. Uh, this one is on the Internet of Bodies, Body Data and Ethical Futures. This is from Ghislaine Boddington. She's an award-winning curator and director specialising in the future human body responsive technologies and immersive experiences. She's co-founder and creative director of Body Data Space. I hope that's how you say it. It's got the little arrows. Um, <laughs> body Data Space, the pioneering interactive creative design collective who have advocated for the living body to be the heart of a digital debate since the early 1990s. So Ghislaine's going to come on and give us a little bit of an insight into what she's working on now. Please join me in giving her a huge round of applause. Hello, everybody. Um, here we are on the second morning of Beyond, and very much looking forward to the rest of the morning, too, and great to meet everyone. So... So I'm going to talk, um, as said, about the Internet of Bodies, which is the research area that I've been working on within collective work for the last 20, 30 years, actually. So just to tell you a little bit about my background, I'm coming from performing arts, from a dance training background, and I started to cross over with technologies in the late 80s, early 90s, particularly looking at live connectivity, telepresence, remote stage connection, so connection between people, and collective embodiment. So... We are all aware today that our physical and virtual worlds are blending. They've shifted, and they have shifted with it our understanding of what our identities are, of our collaborations, and of the innovations that we're making. And finally, and I say that with quite a big smile on my face, we recognize that our bodies have become the interface. Now, body data space, we are what we say. We work with body and data, and virtual physical space. We're a collective of around 30, with a lot of different skill backgrounds, but many of us are coming from performing arts. And we have a clear mission to keep the body at the center of digital interaction. So our starting point is always looking at liveness, the liveness of actually being together here today at this conference, gathering together, traveling as we have, to actually be together, network, sit with each other, cross over, have meetings, and hear each other face to face. And some of these liveness points, the sensory richness of being live, this unique experience, this real-time connectivity between humans, which is so special, yeah? This is very much part of our training in performing arts. Many of these concepts around the edge here, we develop hugely within performing arts understanding, within our bodies, the, the presence, what is presence, what is absence within a stage scenario, how we deal with our breath, how we deal with immediacy and intimacy in these scenarios. And actually, we all deal with these in our communications every day. This is a very special part of living in this world. And these, many of these sensations are always on. In fact, two of them we can never turn off. Our heartbeat and our breath, even when we're sleeping, they are always on. We are living beings. Now, for body data space, we've spent the last 15, 20 years looking at this, looking at the human and actually where we're going today towards the cyborg and towards the avatar. And what are the stages that we've been doing and what are the experiences that we've been happening along the way? And actually now, today, we've reached most of these edges of cyborgness and avatars. And we've heard about some of them the last day. We've been working looking at intimacy within this. We've been exploring digital intimacy with avatars, working real time within virtual spaces and with performance. We've been exploring digital intimacy with robotics. This is the blind robot, a robot that touches your face. Quite an uncanny valley scenario, which many, many people have experienced. And this is digital intimacy of working in virtual worlds, connecting four or five different countries at the same time, joining our avatars together, and trying to find each other in a hug within those virtual spaces. And then we've moved on to examine what we call a hypersensory self. Now, this is the slide I want to hold on to a little bit, because actually, today, in your pockets, you actually have a device or two or three which actually 
does deal with most of the things on the far left side of here. Your audio and your visual, your proximity for your GPS. You use gesture and touch to actually shift things around on your screens. We know that many of these transmissions from ourselves, data coming from the body out, yeah, are actually received back in different ways. We can put voice out there and receive text back. We can put touch and we receive an image. This data transmission and reception from our bio signals out to sending data out and receiving it back is very much part of our daily lives. And on this side here, many of these we're also dealing with. Biofeedback, I don't know how many of you use fitness bands, quite obsession with the quantified self around the biofeedback side. Um, taste and smell are being explored by many artists and scientists in terms of digital. Touch, haptics, proprioceptics of the muscle movements, our blood flows. And many of us may have come through airports even to come here. Facial, iris and retinal are very much part of daily life now. Now, the one thing about this is that we can do is that we can turn this off. And actually, I don't know if you do, but I do. And I do take that digital break at holidays and at weekends. You can switch it off and the memory stays there and we can go back to that memory point. Now, we've continued to work into what we call immersive experiences. These are large scale experiences, which actually are for collective use. So what we're interested in is collective embodiment, how we actually come together in this data space, fully immersed in the sense of data around us. How do we actually create environments for the future where the full body is involved in data, with no wearables, with no wires, where we can move naturally in the way that we genuinely do? So, this is collective reality, an experience that we made for Nesta's Future Fest a few years ago. And the base here was to experience togetherness. It's quite a simple work, actually using biosignals, but actually just using it from motion. We're blob tracking here, actually moving it through into creating audio and visual sensations all around us. Collective reality moves us through into thinking about the future of these types of collective spaces. Here, where the individual can join the group into a convergence, a future immersion space, which is for collective co-creation. And here, where our data cells are tethered to our physical cells, where our biometric signals and data, poten potentially with the additionality of AI, possibly attached personally to the self, will create real-time, hypersensory participation environments, a convergence of body censoring technologies. Now, this convergence comes together. Many of you in the room will be working with two, three, four of these areas already. But perhaps at a future beyond, we'll be looking at how we put most of these together into scenarios where our bodies are fully engaged in data and in data where we can share and be together in it, collectively enjoying that space. Now, in the hypersensory space, and in this space, we're dealing with biosignals. And we're dealing, actually, there with a whole set of data rights. And actually, in the prediction economy, this is what is the most valuable thing out there. For corporates and governments onwards, we know what happened with our data from 20 years ago. Our dates of birth, our emails, our telephone numbers. Now we're looking at the data of our bodies, our identities our facial recognition, our fingerprints, our voices. Actually, how we move through the world is being recorded, is being harvested and fully tracked. Now, the obvious example is China, where the fully tracking of all citizens is a big debate worldwide and actually is even under debate in China itself around regulation. But in many, many places, corporates are engaging in what will be the new multimodal biometric entry points for banking, for identity, for voting. In India already, the Adhar system, actually 1.2 billion citizens have already joined an ID system where you use one photo, two iris scans and 10 fingerprints to create your identity. And that is your unique self 
and is related into the voting system, into funding systems, into everything around you. So that digital bio-citizen starts to exist out there. And in Britain too, we've had many um, discussions and it's come up in the papers regularly recently around the issues of facial recognition. Some of you may have heard of the King's Cross experiment that happened recently where thousands of us, including myself for sure, were actually, our faces were taken and by a private company and used and sold, actually onwards for use for facial recognition data banks in links with the police, agreed by the police. And equally in South Wales, where we've seen those issues come up too. Now, the UK Biometrics Commissioner, actually, he's only in charge of DNA and fingerprinting, but he is very aware of these issues, which is much more than just our DNA and fingerprints, has actually at the moment managed to get through the House of Lords a moratorium on automatic facial recognition in public space. And I believe Holyrood is also in the middle of a discussion about this, putting a halt on it until it be, can be discussed properly to deal with the invasiveness of it and the connections to police and other uses for future prediction of many things. Now, there's very little other regulation in the world. GDPR does cover some but very little. So we need to start to look at actually how are we considering this space? How do we, the creators and the innovators, starting to work with all these biosignals, look at this? So if this is the future of immersion and we're using the hypersensory, and if we're working into much different kinds of spaces onwards, here we took collective reality to the dome venue in SAT in Montreal. Now, dome venues are growing up all over the world. There's going to be three or 4,000 built in the next few years, yeah? These are spaces where we can work collectively within data for education, for arts and entertainment, for many different areas. And these immersion spaces will use biosignals and they will use and be looking at crowd behaviour and structured improvisation and the dramaturgical use within these spaces is all important. So... The convergence of body data is a very personal thing, how you feel about it. Now, everybody in this audience will feel very differently about their personal body data. For me, my body data is very important. I'm coming from a dance background. I believe my heartbeat is mine. My breath is mine, yeah? And I would like to look at a world where we actually considered personal data rights belonging to ourselves where we actually take human rights and privacy and identity forward into the next generations for our children, for our grandchildren, for our nieces and nephews onwards in the right way, having mucked up already slightly for everybody out there in, in, in advance. So one of the ways to look at this is in your own companies, and this isn't necessarily the solution, it's just one way of looking at it, and I think everybody would draw a different diagram in this case. But for your, your, in your teams and in your companies, in your startups, always look at personal data in terms of an ethical data policy. Number one, do always include body experts at the base of your project or team. If it's a neurologist or a physiotherapist, a dancer, choreographer, a theatre person, what's the right person for your product and service to be involved with the expertise coming from the skills they have? And secondly, as a group, discuss really look at whether the preferred model for a base revenue, revenue income is based on biometric data and whether that extraction and sale of biometric data is within your ethical thinking as a group, as a team, as an individual. And mitigate that from the design point up, actually looking at the, on, you know, mitigate against ongoing misuse of data, mitigate against bias from the baseline of your design process. In GDPR, there is one, one section called privacy by design, which actually does require us to use minimal data, to pull the minimal data we need from anything we're doing. Not so well discussed and known. So, and get yourselves involved in this debate. Actually look at the fact that, as we know, regulation doesn't catch up with this properly. We need to be involved in that debate and have our voices in there. Tim Berners-Lee has just put out um, the, the SOLID project. That may be one that we should all be looking at in detail now and discussing and joining and seeing how that moves forward. 
because this is for our futures. Now, just to finish this, to show how complicated this is already getting, I'm looking ahead at working um, in the future with implants. Now, I do a lot of work already with the cyborg community, which is unbelievably quite big around the world. There's an amazing set of people out there who have chosen to become cyborgs for a variety of reasons. And they are working on a cyborg bill of rights. So their rights are being looked at there. And I do these human chip implant shows. This actually is at Mobile World Congress. This year, it's about the fourth or fifth one that I've been involved in. And here, these are tiny microchips, like smaller than a grain of rice, which are usually put into the finger here, into the finger, into the palm of the hand here. They can do many things. I'm sure you've read about them. They can open your laptop. They can open your security systems at home, log you in and out of work. And there's lots of ethical discussion to be had around it. But I wanted to just be clear with you that this is, this is advancing rapidly. We already have over 200 medical implants, and many of those already transmit and receive data. And incredible, some of them, deep brain stimulation for different motor neuron diseases, etc. But I can tell you on, the, on this chip implant side, this particular event at Mobile World Congress, as you can see, was sponsored by Sabadell, one of the biggest banks in Spain, who are actually chipping now for you to use your bank account to do payments and transactions for your banking. Swedish Rail actually has 5,000 businessmen now have been chipped to look at their season cards for travelling on the train. So they just hold their hand out and the conductor puts the swipes like this. Yes, they're fine. They're on their train. And MasterCard are looking at it, TSB are looking at it, and including in developing countries where this is potentially very needed for people who are on the move, refugees, climate change, identity being held within you, actually being held within your body, who you are, your papers, your information, to cross borders, to vote, to get the funds that you need. And for SMEs in Britain starting up, there's a new one called Impli that you can look at and sign up to now to have a small chip to contain your medical data. So look at the selfhood and look at the agency in this and look at actually what we can make from this when there is a bio-connected networked future ahead of us. And will we be, what will we be discussing about that selfhood in the future? The social good and the diversity and inclusivity that can come through this and look at embodied intelligence and the biosignal data that comes from that and discuss within your teams how to ethically use that. So, thank you very much. <laughs>